Hey, everyone. Hi. Hello. Welcome to another episode of Allison Rosen is your new best friend. I'm very excited to bring on our guests in a moment. But first, I must chat with producer, self-professed bad boy of podcasting, Tony Thaxton. Hello. How's it going? It's going all right. How you doing, Allison? <laughs> I'm good. Um, I wanted to give you an update and the listeners an update for anyone who's invested in the story of Daniel, my husband, and his <laughs> hair journey and the hairbrush that is slowly encroaching to my side. I feel like I just need to catch everyone up. Uh, I only knew Daniel as someone who had very short, I assumed, straight hair. I never really thought about the texture of his hair. I also I, I don't have feelings about it. I don't care. Uh, but lo and behold, he had been hiding the fact from me that he has very curly hair. I have naturally curly hair. Our children have curly hair. And in the pandemic, he's decided to grow out his hair. He's having a hair journey. This has involved like research, products, hair tools, things like that. I am in favor of it. I like it. I say, let it out. Let's see what lies beneath the follicles. However, there's a hairbrush of his, which, I, and as I explained on the Thursday show with Art and Marine and Rob Cohen and Jeff and Tony, um, and Daniel was not able to make that show, which is why I was able to tell everyone what's going on. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's never stopped you before, him not being there. I know, but it, I, <laughs> I had more free reign without him there to insert himself. Allison, Rosen, Allison, you knew best friend. I have annexed about like five eighths of the bathroom counter. And so, and now he has all sorts of crap on his side of the, of the bathroom because of all the hair products and all the, this whole hair journey. Um, so anyway, he has this hairbrush that I keep putting back on his side and then I come back later and then it is on my side and I don't know what's going on. I don't know if he is forgetting that it's his and he thinks it's mine or whatever. So then Rob Cohen, a mischievous kind of guy recommended that I just start taking pictures of it and documenting it. So after the, I was very excited about this after the show for, I would say like two days, it didn't move, but here's the update that I'm excited to share with you, Tony, and with people who are invested. <laughs> I now have photos of it making its slow journey. And if you, I, I'm just, I guess some journey is the word of the day for me today. It's, it's beginning to head back on my side. Now it is now definitely on my, it's like not all the way on my side, but it's definitely uh, a little more on my side than it is on his side. So some options are I can just present him with like a month of photo evidence. I could hide the brush. I can put it, move it back to one all the way to his side. I don't know. But that's what's this could going be just, on. What do you think uh, the possibility of this being a game on his end is? I wondered, is this a psyop on his part mm -hmm. too? <laughs> like two can play that game. I think it's quite possible. Yeah, um, I think I think it's likely. Tony, especially you, if it if you see a slow move there, I yeah. feel like I think he's doing it on purpose. But That's, like, I can he keep this, this up? Can I keep this up? It's only so long that I can keep this up until he becomes aware of it. Given that he's like a part of the show too. But for <laughs> now, I mean, he proudly no longer listens. So for now, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> um. Tony, did you watch Sex in the City, the original? No, I've, I've seen bits and pieces, but I've never, I've okay. never really watched it. No, I can't remember the plot at all. I just remember Carrie was talking about like curly haired women versus straight haired women. And, and she said something like, ah, this is going to make everyone cringe. It makes me cringe thinking about it. But she was like, they're c -c -c crazy. And then she was like, I'm c -c -c Carrie. And I was thinking, he's did the Daniel right now with his hair. <laughs> For anyone who gets that reference, they smirked. That's about it. Enough of this. I'm very excited to bring in our guests. They are world famous. They are the hosts of a very, very popular podcast called Guys We Effed. Um, and I'll have to find out from them. Is it like, should we be calling it Guys We Fucked? Or do they call it Guys? There, I'm seeing a nod. It's Guys We Fucked. Um, sometimes we, it is. Yeah, we, we didn't know what, what the rules were for you. <laughs> Oh, yeah. No, we, we use all the words. Um, and then they okay. also have a special that they just put up on Monday called Our Special Day. It is very funny. You can get it on YouTube. It starts with some audience interaction and then they each do stand up and then it ends with like a very hilarious reenactment. Uh, and, and I have some questions about how all that worked. Um, they also also have their own separate podcast. They do all sorts of things. They're also developing a 
comedy sitcom based on their podcast. Please put your hands together for Corinne Fisher and Christina Hutchinson. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having us. So, so what an so, intro. Thank you. Nice to have you guys on. Okay. So it's guys we fucked. Guys yep. we fucked. <laughs> guys we hugged when we're doing radio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But from the beginning, did it start with all the asterisks in the middle? No. Uh, and then mm. we were rejected when we tried to put the podcast on iTunes. I so see. we put the asterisks uh, and then we still got rejected and then had to do like a whole social media campaign for that. But the 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 asterisking out the the fucked is just the safest bet when in terms of advertising and, and marquees. Got it. Got it. Um, okay. So... Just because I can imagine people saying, wait, how do I know? I mean, people who most people are probably familiar with their podcast. You guys are like at the top of the charts always. But for people who might not know who are like, how do I tell who's who? Can you give us some uh, pointers? I'm the gullible one. Uh, this is and you're Christina, Christina talking. <laughs> uh, yeah, I do weird voices. I talk in weird voices all the goddamn time. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm confused. Well, no longer con- newly unconfused as to who I am. Uh, and, and my self-esteem is, uh, is something new to my life, uh, whereas it's not the case with Corinne. Okay, I will have a, fo- a yeah, thousand follow-up questions Yeah, good cop, bad that. cop. Yeah, that's, that's the easiest way. It's like glass half empty glass half full (laughs) like those are the differences i'm the bad cop if anyone couldn't tell (laughs) christina you you recently discovered yourself and now you have self-esteem that's a very intriguing please fill us in on on who you were before and how this happened um yeah so i grew up in a pretty uh, a a household that was pretty tumultuous but i didn't understand that i was thought that uh, i put my parents on a pedestal when in fact they were, um, they did not give me what I needed, uh, this whole time. So I just put those pieces together recently and with doing that, um, got rid of, a, a, a I broke up with a boyfriend of seven years. Um, that was a, a act, uh, towards running towards my own self-esteem. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I ended relationships in my life that were uneven, uh, in terms of the respect level. And so finally I'm at this place where, um, I treat myself with respect, <laughs> but it was a lot of uh, unpacking. Yeah. Was that in therapy? I am someone who's, I, I'm a big fan of therapy. And also your Love story it. about your upbringing sounds very familiar to mine. Ah, uh, yes. I'm, I'm huge into therapy. When I first discovered the term childhood trauma, I was like, wait, what is this? And then I related to it so much and I was able to articulate things that I could not articulate because I didn't have the tools. So once I discovered childhood trauma and what that meant, specifically, there's this uh, book called The Body Keeps the Score. Oh, yeah. That that's been really recommended helped. to me. Oh, my God. It's a, it's a scientific breakdown of how trauma lives in your body. So that that took away the frustration that I had with myself, with my progress, and why am I doing these things, uh, these behaviors are not who I am. Where are they coming from? So that the discovering childhood trauma gave me the answers that I was desperately craving. Got it. So, Corinne, how was it for you watching uh, watching this transformation of Christina? Mm, I mean, it's it's basically my whole life is watching people go through similar tra- transformations. Uh, you're I, the, what I if you're the like, common denominator? My life is a little bit. What she is. I said, what if you're the common denominator? They meet you and uh, then they transform. It, it's I mean it's possible I hope not I mean I'm very happy for Christina but if this is the pattern for everyone in my life I'm I might kill myself just kidding um it's just it like, is I feel like my life is like waiting at a bus you know it's like me sitting at a bus stop and so I um yeah I just I don't I don't I don't know. It's hard. Like, I didn't realize that everyone had a difficult childhood. Um, and now every, and now I know like most people had a difficult childhood. And I only learned that like similar to Christina having these realizations a couple years ago. Uh, I only learned this about uh, my own life a couple years ago. Uh, but I, as I always say, don't worry, my adulthood is uh, not going great. So every you know, everyone catches up at some point with the trauma. <laughs> um, what do you mean by your life is like waiting at a bus stop? Just, well, because I feel like, uh, well, like as far as like things that a lot of adults have to go through, like learning to love themselves, learning to accept themselves, I always had those things. And so, uh, 
and I know people will come to these realizations in their own time, but there's nothing I can, I like, you know, it's like uh, the wizard of Oz. I can't do that work for other people, even though I wish I could, I wish I could just be like, here's confidence. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've, and I've tried it and people have asked things like, can you teach me how to be confident? But there, you can't teach someone how to be confident. You really can't. And that's why I kind of think a lot of, you know, life coaching and stuff like that is a bit of bullshit because it's, you have to, they can help you a little bit. They can, you know, introduce you to tools, but really you have to come to these realizations and acceptance on your own. And a lot of the stuff that's going on now, as far as like self-help, some of it feels like it's pushing self-love or like demanding that you love yourself because you have to love yourself. Yeah. And there was a similar plot like that. I don't know if you watch Euphoria um, where Kat I- was kind of sitting there and she is just like, but what if I don't love myself? And I think it's so much easier if people hear other people say, I don't love myself and here is me working towards that rather than like, you have to love yourself and that's the only choice because then that just makes you feel more left out. Yes. I, yeah. It, it becomes a way of shaming yourself for sure. not already being there. Yes. I do think with, maybe it's like the memification of anything, but so the, that yeah. like, Toxic positivity, toxic wellness, all of that stuff. And also lately something that's been bothering me, um, and I'm curious what you guys think. Uh, are you First of all, are you on TikTok? Yes. Okay, mm-hmm. so I kind of recently came to, t- and my, my listeners have heard me talk about this before. For the longest time, I was like, I, I don't have any interest in that because I find Instagram reels really annoying. So why would I want to look at an app that's only reels? And then I don't know what happened. I had a dark night of the soul and it led me to TikTok. And I was like, oh my God, everything I've been hearing about it is true. Like it is addictive. It makes it, mm-hmm. and, and it's really like a positive, creative place. I think because for me, Instagram is just, other people bragging about all the great things happening in their life. And it makes me feel bad about myself versus TikTok is a bunch of people I don't know. But so I have spent just (laughs) so many hours of the pandemic looking at TikTok. Um, But I see a lot of stuff about like, here's what boundaries look like. And then it's just a Mm -hmm. woman slapping her hand at the camera and it's like, I said, no, cunt, fuck you. I mean, I'm exaggerating. They're not, that's what I hear. That's <laughs> yeah. what I hear. That's what healthy boundaries sound like to me. Like if I want your advice, I'll ask for it. And like, um, I, I did not give you permission to, to comment on my body. And uh, I don't know. It just, it's sa- They sound so harsh. And I understand mm. with certain people, you do have to create a boundary that's very firm with a lot of people, I feel like they do have a little more emotional sensitivity than that. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the suggestions that they have on TikTok for boundaries, you would, you would be known as the rudest person alive. (laughs) And this is coming from someone who's pretty abrasive. And even I wouldn't phrase things like some of these suggestions. It's not, it's not conducive to real life. (laughs) Right. Yeah, And I think what's happening, TikTok also contributes to the sensory overload that we're experiencing. We can educate ourselves on any, uh, ailments, uh, how to cure ourselves from something, how to have a, how to have a boundary, something like a psychology related, like having a boundary, how to make a salad, how to be a wife, how to be a fuck. And it's, it's too much. I feel like we forget, we get so swept up in these apps yes. that we're like, oh, we have to live our lives and like go outside. Yeah. It's so hard to forget to remember that. Yeah. And then there's this phenomenon, which I be- I've now seen it in two different places, probably both on social media called, I think it's called like noise bottlenecking or something, mm. which is where you're, you spend all this time online. And because you're like reading and going to different places, you think that you're being informed, but 90% of it is just noise. So you think that you're mm. like enriching yourself, but it's just a bunch of bullshit. So that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. I mean, that's- <laughs> That's true. Yeah, I think I think we have to also be careful because just because someone writes something down or shares it in a video that is well edited does not make it true. We have listeners for guys we fucked who send me things all the time, videos about like 
some wellness expert talking about something. And um, I have another show that's about bias and news. So I'm really big on always fact checking everything as much as you can. Obviously, things are going to slip through the cracks. I'm not going to do a full hour of research before I share any little piece of info. Um, but a lot of times these it's really easy to go and find out that a lot of this information is incorrect. <laughs> yeah. And I'll just like link the article back to them. Like, I, you, I hope you're not just trusting anything you come across on TikTok because that's wild. Right. So um, guys, we fucked. If I understand correctly, it started, uh, Corinne, when you broke up with someone. Uh, I was dumped. You were dumped. Okay. Yes. I mean, that's a technicality. But but That's an important one. one. No, it's fine. <laughs> it's okay. It you happens. were dumped, and then you wanted to interview previous boyfriends to sort of put it put the pieces together to figure out what had happened. Is that right? Yeah, kind of. Just so I, I wanted to do like a social experiment to figure out how to be a better partner. Um, because I think of everything like in a like a student way like there's like to me there has to be some kind of logical scientific way to improve any behavior that you have and I think there's like partial truth in that now but I mean it also takes emotional change and emotional development as well right and just fate I guess um you know it's it's funny you say that because the the fate part because I fe- I I had the worst dating history ever. I always went for just the complete wrong guys and then I would become obsessed. Yeah. Obsessed. I don't know if it's too strong or not. I actually feel like it's fairly accurate. I just mean like the most the most emotionally invested and my whole self-worth was tied up with them. And then mm. I did all this work on myself and now I am happily married and I don't know. I don't know. Like, I feel like I couldn't have gotten to that place without all the work. But at the same time, maybe it was just luck. I guess not fate, but luck. Like, I don't know how much it I don't know. I think that if you the if you're going after if your dating history was the way you said, it makes a lot of sense that when you said earlier that you relate to my the the remnants of my upbringing and childhood trauma, that aspect of it, because if you're not shown a healthy version of love. What are you to do when you go out into the real world? Of course, you're going to run after the thing that's not healthy and not realize that it's not healthy or at the same time go, why am I doing this? I'm not an idiot. What the fuck is happening here? And then you decode it through your own history. So it's yeah. really I feel like Kurt and I, have, because we've been doing the podcast for eight years, we are part of it. It's taken so many arcs in ways that we could not have predicted, which I really, really enjoy about the show. And one of them is is us decoding modern modern romance and and sexuality and how society has fucked us up how pop culture has sold us so many lies that we just kind of take as this is how it should go and then comparing ourselves when it doesn't go the fairy tale route when in fact you know everything on the movies that's that's not that's toxic that's not mm-hmm. healthy love i just had a, actually had a second date with somebody today um and we were talking about how pop culture fucked us up and we both have are newly realizing this concept and partly because of the conversations I have with Corinne on it, like when you have butterflies in your stomach, that's anxiety, that's <laughs> not indicative of a healthy attachment. And so I was telling him these things in the car before he dropped me off. And we were both like, yeah, let's like go slow. I'm like, yeah, I've never done that before. You want to try it? He's like, yeah, okay. I'm like, all right, well, see you later, but not too soon. So that's like a toxic dynamic but <laughs> it'll be in like a week or whatever's healthy for us to get our work done and, you know, not be too obsessed with each other. So yeah. it's interesting. It's interesting to decode all the bullshit to, uh, that has been stowed upon us. Yeah. I mean, I think there's this expectation of being swept off your feet and falling in love right away. And um, I don't know. I know that I was always very uh, vulnerable and receptive to like an intense seduction, like the kind that comes from someone who's in another relationship, the way they don't, it's not, they, it's not, there's no stakes for them. So they can really shower you with attention. And yet, yet, I think that that attention, like part of you knows it's not real, which is why it's, it's not intoxicating. It's into- It's so intoxicating. So, um, you know, yeah, but like in reality, it does go slower. Um, okay. So Corinne, you wanted to do a social experiment. Ha- Christina, how did you get involved at the beginning? Corinne and I had been uh, comedy partners for a couple of years at this point. So she had pitched me this idea. We were working on a number of projects. Uh, this was one of them that she had pitched. And she was like, I ca- we got to let's like put attention onto this. I really I can't get this idea out of my head. I think it's really good. Uh, so we got together and I I added the anti slut shaming tagline to it because I had been 
slut shamed my whole middle school, high school career. <laughs> not not so severely, like not in a bullying way, but like you know, with teachers commenting on what I'm wearing or with men mm. like being grossed out that you you're not a virgin, and it's like you guys, you're all hypocrites. You you want if a woman is is uh sati- like uh takes her sexuality uh and um, honors it, everyone's happy. It works for everyone. Trickle down economics is not a thing, but if women can get right with their own sexuality and their their self esteem, the whole, we could achieve world peace. I truly believe that. <laughs> so um so yeah, there was all of these hypocritical um, parts to to the way women were treated in media and in real life that I'm like, fuck this. Let's uh, p- please add an element of just calling calling that out. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're at the beginning when it was about interviewing um, previous uh, relationships, were, were the guys mostly pretty receptive about coming on? Yeah, honestly, yeah, surprisingly so. I found I found that it was the really serious boyfriends that I had the most difficulty getting on. The the few really serious boyfriends who weren't in the entertainment business. Uh because I mean, in their defense, there's no unless they just really wanted to have a heart to heart. There's really no Publicly. thing in it for them, I suppose. Right. I mean, I find it very helpful, but I you know, th- that's also why I'm in the entertainment business because I don't have problems having vulnerable conversations in public um i actually hate doing the podcast live with anyone who i want to be vulnerable with but as far as like in a studio setting or when we used to do it in christina's living room like to me that was an it was easier to have the conversation with christina there than if i was to have the conversation with one of those partners like in a cafe to me that is like an absolute nightmare but Mm -hmm. that's my own uh communication issues and so what did you learn about yourself or about people? Uh, I mean, I think we just just learned that mo- most of the times a relationship doesn't work out because you are with someone who is not the match for you. And I think like it's upsetting, but really, really, really liking someone is does not a relationship make, Yeah, you know? And that's for me the bad news. Like the, there's a couple people that I really really like but as far as on a day-to-day can I function with them in a partnership no (laughs) like absolutely not and it makes sense if when I think of my um my two best friends uh I could not live with either of them I couldn't see them every day like it wouldn't be good whereas Christina is one of my really 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 good friends and I spend more time with her than anybody else no and it's no problem yeah. Yeah. It's uh, sexuality is so interesting. I think we, t- we, we, ex- we, you know, it's like our default mode is monogamous. Well, why? Like I, I, one thing that I've really learned from doing the show is like, I kind of want to challenge these parts, both for me personally, um, and for the world, I think it's worth challenging because, um, you know, especially nowadays, women have been really uh, pushed and encouraged to what are your career goals? Like what, you know, go after your dreams, like make a plan. And and we don't put that time, that same consideration, that same thoughtful consideration into relationships. Um, like what do we want out of them? Like what mm-hmm. does a healthy relationship look like for us? And and having those conversations are vital uh, because I think love is like the best thing in the world. And it's my favorite thing in the world. But when it's not healthy, even though it feels so goddamn good, <laughs> it's, going to drain you and leave you at the bottom of the swamp. Yes, totally. Um, Corinne, in our special day, which again, everyone go check it out. It's available on YouTube. You talk about um, being in an open, well, no, you were dating a guy who was in an open marriage. Yeah. A couple years ago. Yeah. What was that like? Um, it was something like that. It was interesting because it's something that, was okay for a small period of time. And I was open with him for the, from the beginning. I was like, listen, I'm not going to be like the third wheel forever. But at that time in my life, I had just gotten out of a really serious relationship um, that I ended, but I ended because the other person wasn't putting in um, enough work and I didn't want to end it. So I think when you don't want to end a relationship, you're kind of like still in partner mode Um, And I knew that this person would be a good partner and comforting and was enthusiastic about being my partner, but that 
I didn't have to worry about getting into something long term because he already had a wife. And not that my end goal um, in any way is to be a wife. I kind of don't think I want to get married at all. <laughs> and no one's asked. Um, but I, I, I actually just don't think I want to be married. Um, and uh, and so it was a nice way to explore someone who had made a commitment to someone. So, you know, they don't have a fear of commitment um, and get attention, but not too much. It was actually like a good amount of attention for me because I find being the primary partner really suffocating. Um, but I would also never want to get married to someone and have them have a girlfriend. So I don't know. I'm, I'm really big into, I'm like, I'm comfortable with myself and I'm not worried about getting hurt really anymore. So I find it interesting to explore relationships in different ways Mm -hmm. even if they're not something that I would do long term right um but it was good it was weird it was definitely like interesting uh setting boundaries with the wife and I gotta say it was one of the most positive experiences I've ever had with another woman usually don't think of like sharing us a, a, a male sexual partner with another woman as a positive experience right because of the way culture has um like brought us up as heterosexual women um but i admire this woman greatly um and i think that like open marriage really does work for them obviously and it's was so apparent in the way that she conducted herself and like i just have yeah i just have like endless respect for her was she also dating people? No, but that was her choice. She had no interest in it. Huh. So then I think what happened is like she married a husband who truly uh, there's very few people who I feel are actually polyamorous and the polyamorous yeah. community gets pissed off when I say that. But um, I think a lot of people try open relationships and stuff. And it's like it's just people who can't be monogamous for yeah. whatever reason. But polyamory is something very specific it's the ability to love multiple people at once and i think very few people have that that quality in the way that we're we're talking about mm-hmm. when we're talking about polyamory this man actually did though he truly had enough love for me and his wife um and i would tell my therapist i was like i this i mean he was one of the best partners I've ever had. And he was literally married and he was doing a good job in his marriage. Um, And so some people are just built with a lot of love in their hearts. You know, I'm not one of them, but God bless this guy. (laughs) Yeah. I don't think I am either. Christina, what about you? Yeah. I got a lot of love in my heart, but, uh, but, but I think um, monogamy, not strict monogamy is for me, but, um, you know, when you when you enter a relationship with somebody, you can make your own rules. It's whatever works for you and your partner. Every pairing of two people is completely different. Um, I'm going to be different with my ex boyfriend than I am with this other guy, and and you know, so so it's a matter of finding what works for you. And um, the last serious relationship I was in, we ebbed and flowed, and we're monogamish, um, and it really worked. And it was it was just cool. It was cool to be in a relationship where it's like we can talk about the possibilities without being scared. These ideas mm-hmm. don't scare us. They're just conversation. And if it's something that makes you jealous, well, yeah, people get jealous all the time. It's okay. It's what you do with that. It's not, I got jealous. Well, if you're a child of trauma and you haven't addressed that and you get triggered, yeah, that's going to be a problem for you. But if you are in an, even in an open relationship or closed relationship and you get jealous, that's something that you can deal with. So um, this attitude of like, it's not the end of the world um, has been very helpful. So... <clears throat> how did you so I'm curious about all the various incarnations of the podcast but also I'm wondering like how how did the media domination happen how did you <laughs> how like you started the podcast and then do what do you what do you like was there a certain thing that for you guys like pushed you you know how did we all the waves. exposure happen yeah we have we have had multiple waves with guys we fucked um like surpluses of eyes on us of of you know uh, of new listeners the first one was corinne's friend who's a journalist wrote uh, writes for the daily beast mm-hmm. so the first ever he asked he requested an exclusive uh for the podcast and corinne was like sure because we were both like i mean it's a good idea i laughed but- I don't think people are going <laughs> to listen to this. Um, so the the headline of the article, because we got denied off iTunes, was the podcast too hot for iTunes. Oh. And I just, I, the timing of it all was really good. Kurt and I's chemistry is f- fucking magic. Uh, and, and it always has been. And so we get to like dance and play while we're on the podcast in that dynamic, which is lovely. Plus, we both have a no bullshit approach to let's talk about these really uncomfortable things. 
and let's let's up the ante even further by having that conversation with the ex that sometimes you would go to the grave without ever having this type of conversation. So it was really fun. It was this really cool social experiment. And then um, that was the first wave. And then I remember we got our first like big, famous, famous guest was Amber Rose. Mm-hmm. Um, and we got her on. Corinne emailed her lawyer. So this was all like us, you know, reaching out to people, DMing people, like begging people. And um, she was a like, little yeah, backstory just so people are like, uh, don't know why. Like I have a lot of tricks up my sleeve because I had come from the world of talent management. So Thank that's God. I like I, and I obviously I always wanted to be the star myself. So I basically worked in talent management for five years. I uh, used my brain as a sponge to stop up all this stuff and then used it for me and Christina. <laughs> Good tactic. <laughs> Which if you have it's smart. To spend. Okay. So smart. And it's helped us a lot, a lot. And one of the things was, you know, we wind up at Amber Rose's house setting up our gear as she's like coming down from her home gym looking perfect. And we have like a really fucking good conversation. Um, Really interesting conversation. It was so, it was really cool. It's kind of like this high to like talk to this person with this persona, but it's like, cut through that like they don't give a shit about that and i don't give a shit about that so like what what is the meat who are you what's your you know the heart and then that I'm interview s- i'm so sorry up- i feel so stupid Re- i i know the name amber rose and i feel like i have what is she famous for uh so she she dated unfortunately she she does other things but one of the first things was she dated <laughs> kanye west okay so uh but she does other shit and she's a cool chick and she also uh, um she brought she she did not create it she's, she's sometimes uh yes uh, credited with creating it but she didn't but the, the slut walk um she made really famous and so yeah. the reason why it was cool and important that she was on on our show is because certainly at the time and, and maybe even still she uh was the most famous uh anti-slut shaming advocate right yeah, she really pushed for that. Um, and uh, she had her own experience getting dragged to the media. That interview, through the grace of the PR gods, I don't know. We ended up airing it the same time that, God, I'm getting deja vu, that Kanye West was openly freaking out on the internet about how he doesn't <laughs> like a finger up his butt. But in that interview, we spe- Amber specifically, we weren't fishing for this, but we ended up talking about how Kanye had a finger up his ass or something with that. It coincided and we were, it was People oh, Magazine picked it up, <laughs> you know, Us, Us Weekly, E! News, all these places. So, uh, yeah, the and, famous and within- say, the famous tweet was finger in the booty ass bitch. Yeah. And it has just resurfaced because of all the stuff that's going on with Kanye, which is, you know, part mental health, part mm-hmm. harassment of Kim. Um, yeah. So that's a whole other story, but <laughs> yeah. So that was a wave. And so it just, yeah, it just, it's the, we've experienced these, these waves, uh, pretty consistently throughout the create, uh, since the creation. Is there a comma in finger in the booty ass bitch? Or is she the one who is putting <laughs> her finger in the booty ass? I, I think, think she was sh- calling Kanye. It would be almost be hyphenated is how I would do it. Yeah. Like finger in the booty ass bitch. Like it's a, oh, like it's a, that's command. a bitch that, that's a bitch that likes her finger in the booty ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? So, yeah, that's what that's what uh, Got it. Amber said to Kanye. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. I needed to punctuate that. Um, no problem. <laughs> oh, that's so that's so cool. OK, so at the beginning, social experiment, then you started interviewing um, more uh, notable people. Right. And you've had a lot of people on. And then um, were you always taking questions? We started reading SoundCloud comments. Uh, Because some of them were mean (laughs) and I thought it was funny. And so we would just read them. And then people started asking us questions. And then we're like, well, I guess we had an email for our comedy duo. So that's why we were like, yeah, sorry about last night show at gmail.com if you have any questions. And we, I mean, that was the floodgates have never closed since then. And uh, we have uncovered the psychology of people's sexuality and like the culture and how we're all doing as as sexual people, I think, can be um, found in our inbox. All right, then I'm going to ask you my own personal sexual question. Uh, two young children, very little libido right now. Has that mm-hmm. come up in your inbox a lot? Oh, all the time. Not Absolutely. wanting to have sex with a partner is, a, I would say, one of the most, for whatever reason it is, a lot of times it's mental health issues. I say a lot of times it's depression related. Um, but yes. that is one of the most <laughs> common things we get in our in our e- email inbox. That's just because of the age, though. So, But I mean, postpartum is definitely, or whatever the reason is. Or you're busy. Postpartum or just child raising children, you know? Right. Um, but it's common, yeah. Yeah, my therapist said that that, 
I forget what she said. It wasn't as explicit as like, oh, yes, the exact thing you're saying is I think what she was saying is something that like hormonally it makes sense and kind of just mm. intellectually it makes sense, too, that it's like, yeah, after you pop out two little ones, it, 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 you're 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 focused on other stuff. Yeah, I can mm-hmm. imagine. I can't imagine. And also that this note, I always I've been thinking about this a lot lately. If I had a child, if I if a man impregnated me and I had that baby and he and I baked that baby and then I gave birth to that baby, that man better n- better not look at me funny. Like that I'm like <laughs> you do you understand what I just did? Like that that is huge. You are you're you're using your body to feed humans, to to make to bake humans, to birth humans, to feed humans. And, and I can't imagine of co- like th- anytime I've heard a story of like the husband after the wife has kids, uh wh- why don't you want to fuck? Why don't I want to f- did, did you see what happened? Are you what? So that uh, whew, I ha- I would have some things to say. <laughs> um, yes. Okay, good. Uh, and then uh, my other question. So, uh, y- Christina, you made a crack in your stand up um, on our special day about uh, um, this is not the whole not the whole bit at all, but just an offhand like about f- being afraid of anal. And then I think on your Instagram, I saw like a uh book about how to be good at anal and i famously <laughs> i think this this information uh, heads into a room before i do famously never done anal i am afraid of it it's an ongoing joke on the show but anyway so what where are you with anal now oh oh my anal journey has yeah. oh it, it has blossomed into are you a booty I ass bitch i i i i you know what i like sticking something up a guy's but okay. with their consent, um, because I don't have a prostate to stimulate where I can have an orgasm. If you go up my butthole, men do. So this obsession with a woman's butthole, I have come to realize, uh, is, um, is just forbidden territory mm. related. That's what it is. That's the draw. Because over the summer, I found out that from <laughs> my manager, actually, uh, I was on vacation with his family and, uh, we're very close. And, uh, it was a bunch of us talking and there was, I was talking to a bunch of dudes and they're like, yeah, you know, and they were drinking and they're like, yeah, you know, with anal, uh, once you get in the opening, it's empty space up there. Mm. And I was like, excuse me. <laughs> and they're like, yeah. And I, and I was asking other guys in the group, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. when you go up the butt, like it's empty space. Once you get in and they're like, yeah, the vagina is way tighter. I'm like, I, then I'm not going through that. What? I've been sacrificing my butthole for empty space once you get in there? I'm not doing that. Interesting. There's so so much to talk about here. <laughs> so you know. have been sacrificing your butthole then? I have. I actually went to the ER for anal because I Oh my god. Bleeding. Sorry. Yeah, because I couldn't <laughs> stop bleeding. But I wasn't eating enough fiber. So, you know, you learn the hard way, right? But um I was this I was is basically my- nightmare doing this that is, to please just don't, my partner you're married don't do it what there's oh no yeah need to do it it's not you're not it's, gonna be like this fe- feels amazing it's funny because <laughs> and i'm not getting any pressure to do it or anything it's oh, it's okay. just yeah. it's self-imposed it's self-imposed oh. because i remember i was on a podcast many years ago and i said i had never done anal and then um it was esther pavitsky actually for anyone who knows who, she's like what Did, weren't you <laughs> weren't you ever in high school and I was like, well, I was a gigantic dork. <laughs> so I was, uh, I was, I was every kind of virgin in high school still. Uh, but yeah, it's just this sense of like, it's a rite of passage that I'm missing out on. I feel like it I doesn't make be. you a better sexual First partner. Of all, I- <laughs> I'm laughing so hard that you're, that you want to do a, that you think you need to do anal because Esther Povitsky <laughs> told you so. She's a good friend of mine. And this is just, this is really tickling me in a way that you have no idea <laughs> <laughs> i mean esther also she like notorious i just like saw her a couple weeks ago and um I, I i heard that she used to like flash her tits to people and i said esther is this true and she literally lifted up her shirt and showed me her tits so i was like this Aww. is you know she has that that performer you know that that comedian blood in her you can't trust uh, anything we say um yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, listen, I've had anal a long time ago and when I had like in college and then maybe my 20s a couple times, but like there's absolutely no need to do it. I don't think it's it was not always like super painful, but you definitely need like a glass of wine to take the sting off and like there's no. just no unless you're someone who gets really stimulated via your anus, which you would know, you can tell with a finger, you don't need to stick a penis yeah, you don't in there. Need a dick then in like there. there's no need to do this. All and right. also if you're a people pleaser, I don't know if you are, Elsie, <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, then of course you're going to get down on yourself for not doing anal because that's like, to me, um, like that's like reminds me of my people pleasiest days uh, mm. with a partner where I'm like, I'm whipping out anal way early on because I'm like, see, I'm the best, right? You love me, right? And it's like, nah, it, you don't yeah. need that. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know what it is. I guess I just feel like, am I really going to go to my grave <laughs> missing out on one of these experiences that but yeah i might you're not missing out on much okay this may well i mean hello taking the sting out going to the er no thank you it's not fun yeah yeah All have right. you tried anal like um toys like a butt plug or anal beads those no. are fun those feel great all right i'll try that, that gives you pleasure so you're gonna yeah. want to find yeah. something that works for both of you guys right i think i could get into that Tony, yeah. try it. And if you don't and like it, I would go there before I did penis in the okay. butt anyway. Like, because you need to loosen up that area. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> okay. All right. I feel, go- I feel good about all- everything we've figured out here. Um, okay. So at one point, your show was, you're still on Luminary, but at one point you were like exclusive. F- f- fill me in on Correct. that. Correct. Yeah. We just took a... Um, we, we signed a contract, um, a couple of years ago for, it was a two year exclusive, uh, deal with Luminary who at the time was a new company and they were taking a couple podcasts to be exclusive. So it was a pretty like cool opportunity because they only chose a few. And then they also created some exclusive content, uh, with like Russell Brand and Lena Dunham and now Dave Chappelle, um, so we were one of the chosen podcasts and yeah, we went behind a paywall for two years for, you know, there was a, it was a good financial offer, but honestly it was more for our mental health because when you spend, you know, five, six years sharing your deepest, darkest, most embarrassing secrets and, you know, just your relationships day by day, play by play with people, some people start listening for the wrong reasons and other people start projecting on you. And it was just honestly, Honestly, it was too much and not worth it anymore. We're like, what are we doing this for? Um, You you know, and I thought for me personally, it was it came at a great time because I was like mentally, I don't know if I can continue to do this show um, if all these people are hate listening. Like, I don't need to be famous this badly, Mm. like at all. (laughs) Like I used to think I would do anything to be famous. And now I could I'll tell you, I would do very little to be famous. It's not worth it. And Christina, was it similar for you? Yeah, I didn't realize it at the time. But uh, when we went behind the paywall, I was like, oh, this is way better. Because then, like, you know, as I'm getting these revelations about my parents, they can't just take their iPhone and listen to everything I'm mm-hmm. saying about them. You know, it's it's uh, we really started one of the we made a couple promises to ourselves early on with guys we fucked. And one of them is just we're going to be very upfront and honest about what's happening in our lives with uh with regards to sexuality and dating and love and so with that i didn't really expect to to have as so many realizations that were truly life-changing i feel like i've had eight dark nights of the souls since we've started guys we fucked and so i'm a different person than when we started and so um yeah, growing up in front of people and learning from your own mistakes in front of people uh, is can be scarring when, as Corinne said, people are listening for the wrong reasons. Um, and they'll let you know. They'll tweet at you. They'll be real quick to uh, – and then your social media becomes this place of like, oh, tr- like just trigger, 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 trigger. And you're like, ugh, I, I got to, mm-hmm. you know, I got to hide for a little bit. Yeah. I, I will say – so I used to be on the Adam Carolla show for four years and – when you're in, for me, like being in that stratosphere level of exposure, there was so much more negativity than like, and watching some of that peel off, even though it's like, oh, I'm reaching fewer people, but they're not making me feel terrible about myself. Much more important. Yeah. Yeah. People are so obsessed with the, the how much, how many followers, how many listens, how many blah, blah, blah. Eh, if you have an audience, 
that that wants to hear what you have to say and like respects you that's the such a beautiful gift and we've we've you know i know you can't choose your fans but ours ours are fucking phenomenal they really so are. when we when people were listening for the wrong reason or hate listening like what do you mean exactly uh friend my like my friends would text me and be like why didn't you tell me this uh like was or was this about me when it wasn't um and or my mom would say i can't believe you said that i'm like and then before you know it i'm like oh geez i don't know how i'm gonna get out of this situation enter luminary (laughs) Mm -hmm. what also i think from like the public perspective it's also um you know it's it was a real reflection on how society thinks about aging women about unmarried women about single women so obviously this is a show about dating we go in and out of relationships sometimes we get dumped sometimes we break up sometimes we go through men quickly um sometimes we're having a bad mental health day and this is true of everybody but everyone isn't broadcasting it um but because people don't want to deal with their own shit we became the podcast version of you know the Paris room. Hilton drunk driving or Lindsay Lohan going clubbing and it was not okay when we did it to those women and it's not okay mm. to do it to us so that's what was happening it was just like a low scale watching Britney shave her head you know in 2007 um, which uh, you know it, it, we're only now in the past couple of years looking back on the way we treated those people and going oh that was pretty fucked up it's like it was fucked up the whole time, guys. It wasn't just fucked up because you got a self-help book and realized it now. <laughs> but but were you guys ha- kind of melting down in public or do you just mean that sort of like schadenfreude hate watching? It, it just got to we be weren't a lot. Melting, we weren't doing anything that was that was that was not what every woman in her 20, late 20s and 30s does in the privacy of her own house. You know, we all saw Bridget Jones's diary. Is it sad? Yeah. But have a lot of us done that also? Yeah. Is it that if I was writing the script, is that how I would want to portray a woman? No. But like, is it realistic? Yeah. It can be. And it's also so misogynist. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And just getting constant feedback on, uh, yeah. uh, you know, a podcast is a one way intimate relationship. And it got to, to the point where so many people were listening that we were just constantly bombarded with feedback of our choices that we did not want. Yeah. I, I, I um, <laughs> I'm, I'm relating. Um, so yeah, cause I think when you do an advice show, people, sorry, yeah, but when you do an advice show, people, uh, think that that is also a two way street. Like Christina was saying, like, you know, podcasting is not really a two way street, but the difference is that people were asking us for our advice. And on the show, we will be very explicit. Sometimes Christina does ask listeners to write in to help her with things. I, very explicitly tell people to not offer their advice to me. I go, I'm sharing my thought process with you, but do not offer me your advice. I am mm. not asking for it. Like I will say it that explicitly. Yeah. So, so now that you're back wide release, how's it going? Yeah. Good. Honestly, good so really far. Good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, who knows where it's going to go. But uh, yeah, so far, so good. I think I think since we've been back, um, there have been a lot of like similar podcasts to ours. I feel like that the, this is a conversation that's being carried on. Like a lot of people are having this type of conversation. So it's not all like these are the two people that are talking mm-hmm. about the. So it's other. The, the conversation is spread, um, which is great. So um, so then it kind of gives us this opportunity to not be the only people having this type of conversation, but then we can really hone in on like what makes us special. Like what's, what's cool about Corinne and I, or what do we love about ourselves or what do we want to lean into as parts of ourselves? Right. And I also think that, um, you know, going behind the paywall for two years was in a way setting a boundary and saying, if you don't respect us, if you don't listen for the right reasons, we will go right behind that paywall again. We have no problem doing it. And you know how you know, you know that because we just did it. Yeah. (laughs) We just did it and we'll do it again. Um, so you mentioned not asking people for advice, um, but I have some advice about something you should eat, which is delicious. This next ad comes to you. I t- I'm the queen of segues <laughs> <laughs> from a company <laughs> that's cooking the best omelets you'll have all year, all while changing the world one egg at a time. It's called Just Egg, and I'm excited to tell you about it. Just Egg is a cholesterol-free, plant-based egg that will give you the most decadent quiches of your life, the fluffiest scrambles, the e- easiest egg sandwiches of all time, has about the same protein as chicken egg, less saturated fat, 
Plus, just egg is packed with cholesterol lowering polyunsaturated fat. Chicken eggs wish they were this healthy. So I have it in two forms. I have um, bottles of just egg and then I have these frozen just egg. Um, it's like what you put in an egg, uh, an egg sandwich. If you're making that, you just pop it in the toaster, or pop it in the, the, uh, microwave. And, um, it's all so delicious. I was surprised when I took a bite. Cause I was like, Oh my God, I like this better than chicken eggs. It's a little bit more savory, a little bit more umami, which for the longest time I didn't believe was a real thing, but I've since been schooled and now I'm on board with umami and just egg has it. Uh, it's really, they're really delicious. Uh, show off the new cholesterol for you by buying a bottle of just egg today and doing the planet a solid all at the same time. Just egg, really good eggs. Okay. And we are back. Let's I have so many things I want to talk to you guys about. Um, oh, here's a question that's really more for off air, but I was listening <laughs> <laughs> so we can just talk around it. Uh, okay, so there's an episode in 2014 where a woman wrote in and she had just broken up with her boyfriend or he had broken up. I can't remember. And she said that he was famous and she sent in a picture of herself. And then you guys <laughs> looked at the picture and you were like talking about I think your reaction was like, OK, looking at the picture of him. Woof. <laughs> like she was way out of his league. You know, and I know you're, you're not going to disclose who it was because blah, blah, blah. But do you remember who it was? You do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Can you drop it into the chat? I won't read it. I just want to... You, or, you, or just tell me... Can you tell me off air? Because <laughs> I'm I, dying. I'll drop it into the chat. It's okay. uneventful, uh, but yes. <laughs> that was... I'm that dying was the, That was know. the whole funny thing. They were like, this person's so famous. And, and we looked and we're like, ah, okay. Oh, <laughs> yes. Okay. I don't... I, Und I don't even... Yeah. Uh, I mean, certainly well loved right and has a following but yeah, still on paper yeah i guess technically compared to you know your mom or your dad yeah sure right <laughs> that's yeah okay that's one of those things i feel like where the, there's almost this like i imagine halo effect because to to a niche group of people that person's like a a, a big deal probably i guess sure. okay it, mm. it's interesting because at the time i did i, I will argue that that person is a very big deal, but you are correct. You have to be in the circle to know, but to, there are a lot of people who would like lose their mind to meet that person. And I've seen it in, yeah. in real life. And I didn't know, I didn't realize at the time because I wasn't as familiar with what that person did, but now I am. Yes. I'm not really that familiar with that, but I just know that there is a whole scene. Around yeah. Huge. It. And it's big. It yeah. is big. Very big. Yes. Uh, so this comedy, uh, not pilot, comedy show being developed. Special. Yeah. Oh, no, oh, no. Well, I was going to talk about the, the show. The TV show, yeah. 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 Sure. What's the story with that? Oh, it's a TV opportunity that we're really excited about that feels genuine to us. Uh, the, the thing with um, when, when Guys We Fucked first hit the scene and there was these waves, right? We had like the very first wave of the podcast, Too Hot to, for iTunes. Uh, we got pretty I was bombarded, I guess you could say, with like TV opportunities. And it's been that way for eight years. Uh, and I've since learned, Corinne has always said to me, because she comes from the manager's side, she, she has this very vital uh, um, perspective that I do not have. Uh, getting a television show on the air is one of the hardest things you could do. And me, I'm like, what are you talking about? We're going to be at the Emmys and, <laughs> and you don't get it. And stop being negative, Corinne. You're just, and, no, she's absolutely <laughs> fucking right. Um, because television is this fickle little industry where, uh, there's, there can be too many cooks in the kitchen. So we have, we have created so many, uh, different types of concepts, both scripted and unscripted together that we love, that we're really proud of. And so, uh, and this is, this is one of them. We're, we're really excited. This is genuine to who we are. So, um, yeah, it's, it's in development. So, um, we're just enjoying the ride. So you're we're just developing right now. <laughs> I mean, we yeah. know what the show is, but it's like, it's so funny because, you know, we've been working on it for years and years before it was announced to the public. And now that it's announced, everyone thinks like, oh, it'll be on TV next week. And like, it'll still be like a year. <laughs> yeah. And will you guys be on camera as well? Or you're, yes. So it'll, yes. so you guys yes, will star in it. Yes, we are us. Yeah. It's oh, so that's funny. so cool. It's so interesting. Um, what one of the reactions that I was I was most like, oh, that's interesting. Because uh, if you look at a typical stand up comedian, right, uh, they get a sitcom, King of Queens, uh, Full House. Bob Saget is was rest in peace. God, ugh, I love that man. Uh, yeah. Was a, a stand up comedian. Um, uh, 
there's so that's like a, a, a pretty typical career trajectory for a stand up comedian that gets big is okay, what's your sitcom about? Um, it's kind of like a very 90s career move for a stand up comic. So, one of the questions that surprised me the most was like, are you you guys aren't going to be in it, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, we're going to be in it. I mean, yeah, 100% I think, we're going to be in it. I think the reason I asked is that my I, at first I thought you were and then I read it and it gave you guys writer credit with the we're third both. person. So something yeah. like something about it. The article made it unclear. But my first yeah. instinct it was, was because that it was you a were. development announcement. Right. Yeah. That's why it credited us like that, because the show has not yet been filmed. So they can't credit us as actors because it hasn't happened yet. Right. But that's oh. like to clarify, you're ab- you're absolutely right. When I like reread it again, I was like, they're they're announcing it as a developmental project. And I think also people are confused because of things like uh, Whitney Cummings and Two Broke Girls. Yes. Uh, so projects like that where comedians were behind them but not starring in them. Um, but there's so many different ways you can get stuff on the air and different uh, relationships you can have with projects. So well, That's really cool. Yeah. So the special filmed in Salem. At first, I wasn't sure if it was Oregon or uh, Massachusetts, <laughs> but then you made that clear. Um, uh, tell me about how that came about. We, it's been 10 years in the making. We've been doing comedy wow. for a decade. And um, Corinne, Corinne is... Between Corinne and I, uh, we 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 typically have ideas that are ahead of the curve, and one of them was she was pushing. She was like, "I think we should re- self produce our own stand up special." We brought this up to our management representative team uh, five years ago, and they were like, "No, don't spend your own money." And we're like, "Okay." And then cut to five years later, where there's comedians are kind of like, "I'm not going to wait for Netflix or Comedy Central to come to me." I ha- if I if you're lucky enough to have. Uh, money to invest in your back into your own art, put your money where your mouth is, Mm -hmm. uh, you should do it. So that's so, so um, thank God Corinne is very goal oriented and very driven um, because she was like, we need to do a special by the end of the year. Like I have to, that's like one on my goal list. I want to do a special. So we, we quickly made it happen um, and we self-produced it. We got on the phone with both of our managers. Uh, We even the one that you vacation with. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. He's like my he's like my surrogate dad cuz I don't I'm not I don't talk to my family. So um so so it's Rick's my dad. But um but yeah, so we all got on the phone and um uh you know, uh brainstormed and had many phone calls, met with a production company and uh every aspect of the special was, you know, we were involved in, which was really cool and Corinne directed it. That's so cool. Um so can we talk so the 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 last thing, the sort of reenactment. Can we? T- I I don't think it's spoiling to talk about it, right? Or do you? Okay. Sex scene theater. No, we can talk about it. It's fine. Yes. Um. So you do this amazing thing where you ask the audience, uh, audience for, does anyone sext? And then someone hands you their phone, mm-hmm. and then you do a reenactment of it, or, or a dramatic reading of a it, really. theatrical reading. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Make it worse, Rob. <laughs> Make it worse. You are such an effing idiot. <laughs> Did you? How, is this a thing you guys do regularly at your live shows? Yes, we've been doing yes. it for about five years since we started touring, uh, and with no pre-producing. That's my very, question. Yeah, very lucky to go on stage in any given city and say, "Hey, who up here has like a who's being a dumb bitch or who's having a problem that they're like they can't get out of or who who has a dirty sex message that they want to share with it?" Uh, and so people will gladly volunteer because they know and trust us so that's that's also part of the right um so yeah but that the the sexting conversation that ended up making the special uh was just a girl literally uh we were waiting around for somebody to you know stop being so shy because we're like you guys are hoes come on let's like have fun and (laughs) um and uh and this woman just yeah passed her phone up and it was a fantastic fantastic sexting conversation yeah yeah, the only thing that's not authentic is how quickly it happens. We had to edit out a lot of waiting time where me and me and Christina were sit- standing on stage like, come on. And usually it is faster, but I think because people knew it was being filmed for a special, there was a little yeah, extra hesitancy hesitant. than there normally is because, you know, knock on wood, we've never had a city where someone did not eventually, and some cities have taken longer than others. I mean, not more than like a couple minutes, um, but uh, in every city, we've gotten someone to break up a sex message that we read whether they had their friend bring the phone to the stage so they're completely anonymous or not like it's happened i mean sometimes people right bring the phone right up uh, on the stage and then they stand on like want to be part of it so <laughs> they're like okay you can read it now or like you don't need to be here it's okay but yeah it's yeah fun like, please leave <laughs> well, you, that was my question have you ever had a situation where something doesn't materialize 
<laughs> but uh, I wouldn't say it doesn't materialize, but like it doesn't go well. Like like uh, we'll do, um, uh, you know, who you know, seven minutes in therapy is also a segment that we do at the top of the stand up special, and uh, you know, sometimes uh, that'll. It's a comedy show. We are comedians. It's a comedy podcast, even though we talk about some really serious things. And then when you come up and we're like, all right, who has some problems? We're going to do speed round. And they're like, my boyfriend left me yesterday for my best friend. And you're like, oh, man, <laughs> you can't. Come on. So, yes, it's gone awry many times. But it's always, we, we always figure it it's out. It's always <laughs> someone saying something way too sad. Uh-huh. Like, and we're just, you know, and it's, and it's fine because it's a, you know, it's what I call a comedy challenge and mm-hmm. Christina and I always handle it. But then you worry like, because like, yes, I want to be there for that person who was vulnerable with us, but also I can't ruin the whole show to give you a therapy, like a real therapy session right now. And also it's technically illegal for us to give you therapy. Um, <laughs> so we're just giving, we're doling out advice. Yes. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we and so now we kind of give a disclaimer like this is a comedy show don't ruin the comedy show with your sad sad life mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. we all yeah. know shit's sad uh that's why we're all here so let's laugh <laughs> yeah, yeah the advice thing it's a hard needle to thread i mean you guys are really good at it i host another podcast with greg fitzsimmons called childish where we people write in with their parenting questions um and we are not experts at all but i listen i don't listen back <laughs> that often i know i should but i listened back to an episode and I was like, oh my God, I'm so, I'm trying so hard to make sure that I give that one person the perfect advice and that I canvas all sides of it and stuff that I'm forfeiting and the entertainment value. Mm. It's a balance, man. It's a tricky balance between like really coming from the heart and giving somebody yeah. a piece of information that you feel good about giving or, or a piece of advice that you feel good about giving and then being genuine to who you are uh, while also being entertaining. But uh, I think if you're coming from the heart, it's automatically going to be riveting because it's your human truth. So, um, Christina, you said that when you guys started the podcast, you made some promises to yourself. One was that you were always going to be authentic um, about sexuality and what's going on in your lives and stuff. I was just wondering, do you re- what were some of the other promises you made? Mm, I think that was. I mean, for me, I think for one of the ones we talked about, maybe more recently, Christina is like not to talk so openly about relationships in real time. Mm. Yep. Yep, and let them. I don't know if you're sticking to that one. No, a hundred percent. No, I am. I absolutely am. Uh, yeah, because uh, especially with like on the podcast, like when we do when we record the intros to every show, usually is when we get personal. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm dating again for the first time in two years, and I'm like, yeah. Uh, one of the things that I want to do this time around is keep that private. And then there's so many other things that I'd want to talk about that have to do with sexuality and dating that don't have to do with what I am experiencing in mm-hmm. this moment. So. That is a promise. Is that hard? I would think that would be hard to... uh, I mean, I know for me, I had talked about my life as a single person so much that then when I got into a relationship... I uh, and all of a sudden it was his business, too. I was like, now I'm like losing a chunk of what I normally talk about. Yeah. Well, I just talk Mm. about it to Corinne. I talk about it to Corinne privately off air. So I get my I get my fill. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think uh, like I have a boyfriend and I like I'll mention him on the podcast or like little silly things. But I think I'm I'm keeping it a little bit more surface level. Like uh, he's a lot younger than me, which is, I think, interesting. So I'll talk about that kind of more theoretically. Um, and, uh, the stigma that surrounds that when the woman is the older person and like funny things will happen. Like I accidentally took him to a strip club for the first time. Like, I mean, I, I knew we were going to the strip club. I just didn't know until we were in the Uber that it was his first time at a strip club. So things like that, that have like high entertainment value, but will not affect our private relationship. But I'm not like dissecting my day-to-day feelings or struggles with things the way we've previously done. And I was also single for a large span of the the podcast because the impetus was this really serious breakup I had. And I took like four years off from having a serious boyfriend. So that there's a big chunk in there that I could, I was just talking about like sex and people that I don't want to say didn't matter, but didn't matter as much mm-hmm. to me as a partner. Have you guys found that guys are hesitant to be involved with you because they don't? Uh, well, actually, 
twofold question, either because they don't want their their business in public. And then secondly, do you find that um, men have these preconceived notions of who you are because you host a podcast called Guys We Fucked? Mm. I haven't had I haven't had the beginning. I I was I was with somebody when we started the podcast. um, And so I was with them for the first four years of the show. So that that was, you know, that was fine. And then uh, when I dated after that, no, honestly, the guys respected it. And I wouldn't want to date a guy that didn't respect it because mm-hmm. I don't like the way they think about that subject matter anyway. So so, yeah, it's it does a great job of uh, weeding people out, I guess, because if they if somebody did have a problem, they didn't tell me. And honestly, frankly, I don't want to hear about it because I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to fuck with I want to fuck with you. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, for me, it was a bit of an issue in the beginning. Um, it, two parts, because number one, you didn't know. Uh, I was just like, I'm very like wary of people um, in general. So I there was a couple people that I was like, Do this, does this person want to have sex with me because they want to have sex with me or because they want to be on my show? Mm. So I, I kind of made a, a point where it's not like you would sleep with me one day and like the next day you would get to be on the show. I really gave it some time. So people didn't think of my pussy as like a pub- publicist. Um, I love it's like you're not because you're not giving it away. But the it you're not giving away is the part where you talk about it on the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like absolutely not, especially because I was having sex with a lot of like people in the entertainment business. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, the second part where like people I've definitely had like PR meetings when I've gotten into cer- to relationships about like what I will say if I will tag you on Instagram, that kind of stuff. That's more me protecting them, though. Uh, people don't people think they understand And they just don't understand being in the spotlight until they are in it. And it's so funny because this is like, you know, this isn't even a huge spotlight. Like I can't, I can't imagine the talk like Lady Gaga has to have with her boyfriends before. (laughs) Um, But it's still a lot. Like when you start, you know, you'll start searching your name on Google and it'll Mm -hmm. it'll come up with my name. Um, And that's just like part of dating someone who does a relationship podcast. So I just like to be really upfront with people. And I have to like warn guys, like you're going to get a lot of DMs of people trying to fuck you because you are my boyfriend. And like, it's not okay. And please don't let that be a reflection of like how you think of women or how you think women treat each other but like it will happen and that's not representative of all women like stuff that stuff like that bums me out big time honestly but it's gonna happen so yeah and is that women who are wait they would want to fuck him because he's associated with you because they're fans or because they're like trying to steal your dude or weird you know it's like you're you're talking about someone and it elevates them and i think like uh, I don't know, you know, there's something that a lot of heterosexual women have in them that when someone is, when a man is desired by other women, a lot of women think I want him too. Yeah. And I don't exactly know what that's about, but it is just so, um, and so it happens and it happens a lot. Um, I especially think it happens to me because I'm like the more threatening one when in reality it's like. I want us all to be on the same team and I want you to have boundaries and stand up for yourself and feel good about yourself the way I do. And certainly not the way to achieve that is not by fucking my boyfriend. And I'm still from New Jersey, so I will go absolutely ape shit on the both of you. Um, <laughs> you know. Um, so I have some questions that listeners sent in on Patreon. I'm on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Allison Rosen is where you go. Patreon. There's, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Bonus <laughs> episodes of my podcast, The Friend Zone. There's a level where you can text me and I'll text you back. Uh, we do Zoom parties. You can submit carbohydrates that I will call you on the Thursday show and questions for the guests. And if you subscribe uh, for a year, you get two months free. So it's 12 months for the price of 10. Uh, and uh, let's do these questions. Questions for my fans. All right. Lisa Lowry wants to know, what are the contents of their nightstands? Anal sex books. <laughs> and self-help books. Well, I, tr- I truly have a book called uh, A Woman's Complete Guide to Anal Sex next to a book by Dr. Brian Weiss called Only Love is Real. So <laughs> that's what I got. Well, Lisa Lowry, so nice to meet you. I'm Corinne Fisher, and I don't have a bed stand because I am not an organized person. I have a pile of papers from the baseball card store that I own next to my bed. (laughs) 
<laughs> just some old, old, some old uh, inventory sheets, and there is absolutely not a table there. It's just uh, sprawled across the floor. Wait, is your mattress pretty low? Uh, it's not super high, but it's not super low. I just don't, I just throw stuff on the ground. Like there's nothing, I, I have like a bottle of water and then like my phone's my alarm and I put it on my bed. I'm just not, I am not a typical girl with like a really organized home. Uh, I don't know. I just, I, you know, there's only so many hours in the day and that's not what I, I don't use, spend any of them organizing or cleaning. <laughs> but like, oh no, I'm, I, I don't either, but I do have a nightstand that's filled with shit that I need to go through and like throw throw out. It's very cluttery. Yeah, I have like an old it- chest. Yeah, I don't have I don't have I honestly looked for a bedside table, but I'm like really picky about my furniture. Mm-hmm. It all has to be vintage. And I just surprisingly I found a lot all vintage pieces. I found a bit vintage roll top desk and a bar and you know, a tall, uh, a, a tall what is it called? A tall boy? Yeah, I think it is also called a tall boy, like the drink. Um and I just didn't I couldn't find a, a night a, a bedside table that I liked, so I just didn't get one. Yeah, I hey, if it works for you, uh, <laughs> Whitney C. Who makes their favorite dessert, and is it homemade or commercial? Or maybe she's saying homemade or commercial. Who makes your favorite dessert? I'm not a dessert gal, but I would say Wendy or Wendy's Friendly's, um, the uh, Conehead Sunday. What the is that? Friendlies. Uh, it's a, a scoop of ice cream, scoop of ice cream with a, a ice cream cone, and there's like um, whipped cream for like the hair, and then an ice cream cone upside down on the scoop of ice cream, and then at the bottom, um, after you've done eating everything, it's uh, you find all these M and M's at the bottom. Oh my of the god, dish. that sounds great! Uh, yes, you seem surprised. I don't. I've heard of Friendlies, but I don't think I've ever been to a Friendlies. <gasps> yeah, Where are you they from? Have them very far out west. Uh, I'm, f- I, I was born in Northern California, grew up in Southern California. Oh, okay. Yeah. I did okay, live that's in, wh- that's why it's like I- East, it's e- it's East coasty. We're me and Christine are both from the East coast. So Got that's it. why. And I, I know there's a lot, there's a lot of people who have never been to friendlies and <gasps> man, I, it's, it's one terrible. of my favorite chain restaurants, but, uh, but if you're ever on the East coast, check one out. <laughs> I did live in with low expectations, but then you'll like it. Okay. But I lived in New York for 10 years, but it's not in the city, right? No. Yeah. No, No, not in the city. All right. What about you, Corinne? Uh, I like, I like a lot of desserts. Like in general, I love a chewy brownie with walnuts. Mm. Um, but I think like something I'm really obsessed with right now is I love being a Jersey girl. I love diner cake. And so... Uh, I live near um, a diner that has this like an incredible chocolate chocolate cake. And I'm usually not a chocolate chocolate person, but it's like called chocolate outrage or something. And it's incredible. (laughs) I also love a strawberry shortcake from a diner. Just like a diner is always going to have the best slice of strawberry shortcake. And during quarantine, um, I just was eating whatever I wanted as so many people were, but I was doing it like in a really specific way. So I would eat cake for breakfast a lot. And those were the two cakes that I would alternate between. And like fun fact, if you want to eat cake every day, eat it for breakfast. And at least for me, it won't make you gain weight. So yeah, I load those carbs in the AM, right? Like waffles, muffins, uh, pancakes, yeah. cake. It's all kind of the same. What is, is there an animal behind you and what is it? Oh, like an ant, like a living animal. My dog's here, but I don't think you can see him. I can't. I can see his ears. I can see him. This is my dog. <laughs> and oh, there's Kevin. I heard about Kevin, and so then I had to go on Instagram to find Kevin. Oh my god, he is yeah. so cute. <laughs> He's the best. And then we need to see Corinne's oh, pup. Oh my gosh! This is Sir Alfred Hitchcock. <gasps> he's he's very used to me podcasting, so he knows when the ring light is on. Mommy's working, and he has to go to sleep. But I woke him up. So hi, Sir hi, Alfred buddy. Hitchcock. <laughs> uh, yeah, from the ear, I yeah. couldn't. I suspected it was a dog, but then I thought maybe this is a cat. But no, hi. No, oh my he's god, a little like <laughs> so he's a little. He's a little doggy. So cute. Okay, you can go back to sleep now, buddy. Oh my god. (laughs) I have a dog. I have a dog named Wendy, so I'm on board with human names for animals. Um okay. And do you guys so we do a segment on the show called Just Me or Everyone, where people mention a thing they think or do and they wonder, is it just me or everyone? Do you guys happen to have uh, a just me or everyone? Oh, so oh we were told the, a different thing. So let me think of this really quick. Oh. And I, I, I can think of one, though. Well, there's, I have obsessive um, okay. compulsive disorder, so I'm sure I have a lot. <laughs> Is it just me or everyone? 
All right. Yes. Uh, Christina, you have one? Yeah. Um, ex- um, elaborate masturbation. Like like using sex toys on yourself and like taking your time intentionally and setting the mood and really just treating yourself like there's another person there, but there's not. I don't think you're the only one. I don't know, man. I haven't heard many other people do that. So do you do I mean, that? It, it, it's probably not. I don't think I set the scene as much as you do. Uh, but maybe a little bit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh what about you corinne do you elaborately uh, treat so, yourself I mean, people definitely do this but i think it's a it's again like i think i take it to the next level where i'll do like a private investigator level investigation of somebody um before i date them like I will have seen every Instagram you've posted. I will have s- figured out everyone you've dated in the past five to 10 years, what they're doing, if they're married, how did it, how it ended, uh, th- things you used to do together. Like I will know all of, I'll know what you wore for Halloween in 2017. Like no problem. I just have to make sure I, I'm not bring it up on dates because I've done that before. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's pretty common, but maybe not to the level uh, you go. Same with both. Yeah, uh, you don't think so, Christina? I keep myself in the damn dark. I want to get really? to know you for you. Cause, because of whatever conclusion I'm going to draw from what I find isn't going to be act- the, what's actually happening. So yeah. I know myself enough to know that my um, the, the dots that I connect aren't they're, that's the ones in my head. So it's like, eh, I'll just get to know you old fashioned way. That's, that's better for me. Cause then I don't jump to conclusions. What do you, here's a just mirror everyone. Do you guys do this? I'll be sitting there and all of a sudden someone from my past, whether I actually, probably not someone I dated cause I've already like Googled all of them, but just someone that I had a crush on or someone that I liked will pop into my head. And I'm like, Oh my God, that's someone I could look up to see what they're doing. And I get excited for, for my internet search later. Huh? Eh. Yeah, I've done that. I mean, last time I did it, it was my best friend from childhood, and I found out she was dead. So, whoops, <laughs> mine is too. Well, maybe don't do that anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, I do that. I also think of like almost every ex boyfriend I ever had every single day, and I don't think that's normal for to think of every single one every day. That's weird, huh? Yeah, why? Like real quick, like yeah, they just like come a roll with that. Just I don't know, just like a little rotation, like they're just doing a like a little presentation. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think of them in depth just like oh yeah because like, sometimes someone will be like I'll think of an ex and be like oh man I haven't thought of him in years I'm like yeah that's never happened to me I think of everyone every week <laughs> Tony do you think of your exes that frequently not that frequently they definitely it definitely happens but I, I wouldn't say it's a daily thing now yeah once I'm done with you you're done I don't think of you at all almost to a fault <laughs> uh, I'm gonna put you on the spot Tony you can take this out if you don't if you don't want the answer out there um, you're divorced. How uh, frequently does your ex-wife pop into your head? You know, your timing on this question is very strange because I've talked, I was literally talking about this at therapy, that it's weirdly been happening more lately. And I mm. don't know Uh-oh. why it's not, but it's not like a, it's not like a something that I miss or, or anything. It's not like looking back fondly or it's just like these random things i'm like why why is that popping into my head right now mm. and yeah it started happening a lot more lately and i mm. don't know why i wonder if it is related to you returning from the tour that didn't happen or you know some sort of contextual kind of thing yeah i don't know i don't know but uh nothing you know i don't mean this against her but like yeah i don't need that to be <laughs> happening yeah but yeah. like i'll have weird things where all of a sudden I'll think that I see someone in it's off. It usually happens Mm. when I travel. I'll think I see someone and then I'll repeatedly think I see them. And I'm like, why is this person that I haven't thought of in 20 years suddenly on my mind? And I think it's like, it's a memory being triggered by something. Now, obviously with your ex-wife, I don't think it's like that um, disconnected from what's going on, but I still think like something in your environment or in your psyche or whatever could be like making you think of her more often right now. Yeah, it's very possible. Yeah, I really don't know. My therapist uh, wasn't sure either. 
F- fire this person. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Christina, you have a hiccup fuck yourself? Oh, I sure do, Allison. Uh, you know, I dated a man for seven years, uh, and we had a pretty good relationship, and then I, I broke up with him. And a couple of year, uh, months after our breakup, when I was in the midst of still processing it and being heartbroken, he, he wrote a letter to sue me and Corinne. So, hey, ex-boyfriend, who I don't, you don't, your name doesn't even deserve to be said, go fuck yourself. Hey, hey, hey. Go fuck yourself. What was he trying to sue you guys for? Money. Well, yeah, but I mean, it, it, <laughs> but like on what grounds? Uh, grounds that made no sense, and he didn't win because there was no argument there. Okay, well, it was a bitter, it was a bitter bitch moment. Right. Fuck that guy. Like our, like ours worked, but we had already compensated him and had documentation. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I can guess what this might have been. Um, Corinne, what about you? Anyone uh, that you have to give the business to? Mine's more general. When I thought when I when you brought the go fuck yourself up, I was just thinking about people in general who, when you say something about fast food, like I like Taco Bell or something, they'll be like, "I don't eat fast food." No one cares that you don't eat fast food, <laughs> and I'm sorry that adulthood has made you boring and you can only eat fucking caviar. But I love fast food, and don't bring your negative energy to me. People who say I don't eat fast food, go fuck yourself. Hey, hey. Go fuck yourself. Do you guys happen to watch Real Housewives of Salt Lake City? Or any Real Housewives? <laughs> no, there's a Salt Lake City one? No. Yes. No, but that sounds That's incredible. amazing. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's like, it's very, very crazy. I recommend it. <laughs> Although I kind of, my interest like waxes and wanes with it, but there's some very crazy stuff that has happened. Um, <laughs> But one of the one of the main characters, uh, Lisa Barlow, like famously loves fast, and she doesn't look like she looks like someone who would be like, "Oh, I don't eat fast food," but she'll right. get, she'll like get Diet Coke from one place and fries from another place and oh, something from hell yeah. yeah. She's super She's nerdy it. about it. Yes, she is. Um, it was so nice having you guys on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you like what you're hearing, please make sure that you leave us a nice review. It helps out the show on Apple Podcasts or rate us wherever you're listening. Make sure you're subscribed or following or whatever the language is in your app of choice. Follow me on social media at Allison Rosen on Twitter, Instagram. Christina and Corinne, um, please tell everyone... Uh, p- plug all your things. Tell them where they can find you and what they should look out for, etc. Our special day. That is what we want to plug. It's our debut stand-up comedy special. It is available to watch for free. It is uh, produced by us. It looks fucking fantastic and it's really good you can get that at youtube.com slash guys we fucked without the you in fucked wonderful yeah and then do you want to plug i know you guys each do other podcasts as well uh i'll plug my social yeah, media we, we just wanted to do the call to action to yeah. this but yeah, okay. yeah but yeah yeah yeah. Okay, cool. That's it. Don't do not do anything else. Just watch that special. <laughs> it's so important to us that you watch the special that it's 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 the paramount uh, priority for us. Okay. So that's, we're good. Just plug in that. Empty your head of everything. Make your head as empty as a butthole and just, just the special. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Tony, what about you? Uh, Twitter and Instagram ads. Tony Thaxton and my show Bizarre Albums every Tuesday and the Motion City Soundtrack Tour in June and July now. That's it for now. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. It was so wonderful having you on the show. Listeners, thank you for listening. I love you. You matter. Goodbye. Hey, do you know about the Allison Rosen show? We had a good time. 